In later years, Republicans in the U.S. have tried to label environmental concerns a left-wing socialist ideology. But this has not always been so. Now, on HistoryRadio.org, excerpts from statements on environmental policy by President Reagan made in the early 1980s. The audio was released under a Creative Commons license by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. But they like to get in out of the car. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Well, please be seated. Alan Hill and William Mills and Jacqueline Schaefer and Friends of America's Natural Heritage, thank you for coming here today. It's most fitting that we sign the 14th Annual Report of the Council on Environmental Quality on Theodore Roosevelt Island. This 88-acre preserve is a living memorial to a unique leader of this nation, a man with great personal strengths of vision, of energy, and conviction, who rallied the American people to the protection and preservation of its natural resources. When Teddy Roosevelt became president, our land, forests, and wildlife had been exploited for more than 100 years. Some four-fifths of our prime forest had been leveled. Untold acres of rich farmland had been washed away and lost in river mudflats. Wilderness areas were unprotected. Wildlife had been destroyed in appalling numbers, and some native wildlife species had been totally destroyed. But the consequences of these lost resources had not yet dawned on the public conscience. Well, President Teddy Roosevelt fired the imagination of the American people, shook our nation from its lethargy, and began to rescue the public domain. The U.S. Forest Service was created. More than 243 million acres of land were reserved for conservation, 55 bird and game refuges, and five national parks were established. The Inland Waterways Commission was created to redeem water power for public use. The Antiquities Act authorized preservation of cultural and historical landmarks for the benefit of future generations. President Roosevelt reached the American conscience, and conservation and environmental protection became an inseparable part of the American creed. He told us, the nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. Well, these words must remain an inspiration to all of us, an obligation to everyone charged with the stewardship of our natural resources. The challenges we face today are both numerous and complex. As you know, during the 60s and 70s, many beneficial advances in science, technology, and economic development produced new and unwelcome threats to our environment and the quality of life. And once again, America's conscience was deeply touched. A new and vigorous environmental movement burst forth across our country. The American people joined together in a great national effort to protect the promise of our future by conserving the rich beauty and bounty of our heritage. As a result, our air and water quality is far better today than it's been in many years. We've reclaimed rivers and wilderness areas that were gravely threatened. We can all be proud of the advances that have been made during this rebirth of the environmental movement. My fellow Americans, I think it's time to clear the air and straighten the record on where my administration stands on environmental and natural resources management matters. I know you've heard and read a million words about where others think we stand. Now, how about five minutes of the truth? A few weeks ago, when Bill Ruckelshaus was sworn in as director of the Environmental Protection Agency, he very graciously pointed out that when his agency was created 13 years ago with him as its first director, California was the environmental leader of the nation. Having been governor of California at that time, I was and am very grateful to Bill for those kind words. Let me just say I feel now as I felt then about environmental matters. I believe in a sound, strong environmental policy that protects the health of our people and a wise stewardship of our nation's natural resources. 
My fellow Americans, I'd like to talk to you today about our environment. But, as I mentioned earlier this week, in doing so, I might be letting you in on a little secret. As a matter of fact, one of the best-kept secrets in Washington. More than 15 years ago, the state of California decided that we needed to take action to combat the smog that was choking the beautiful cities of my home state. Out of that concern was born the first serious program to require manufacturers to build cleaner cars and help control air pollution. The auto industry had to build two kinds of cars, one that would be for sale in the other 49 states and one that would meet the stiff anti-pollution standards required in California. We had other concerns in California, such as protecting our magnificent and unique coastline, and we took the lead in that area as well. It took the rest of the nation a few years to catch on, but in 1970, the Congress followed California's lead and enacted the Clean Air Act. Other laws to protect and clean up the nation's lakes and rivers were passed, and America got on with the job of protecting the environment. Part of the secret I mentioned is that I happen to have been governor of California back when much of this was being done. Now, obviously, neither the problems in California nor those nationally have been solved. But I'm proud of having been one of the first to recognize that states and the federal government have a duty to protect our natural resources from the damaging effects of pollution that can accompany industrial development. The other part of the well-kept secret has to do with the environmental record of our administration, which is one of achievement in parks, wilderness land, and wildlife refuges. According to studies by the Environmental Protection Agency, the quality of our air and water has continued to improve during our administration. In many big cities, the number of days on which pollution alerts are declared has gone down. And if you live near a river, you may have noticed that the signs have been coming down that used to warn people not to fish or swim. We came to Washington, committed to respect the great bounty and beauty of God's creation. We believe very strongly in the concept of stewardship, caring for the resources we have, so they can be shared and used productively for generations to come. And we've put that philosophy to work, correcting deficiencies of past policies and advancing long overdue initiatives. Let me give you some facts that our critics never seem to remember. When we took office in 1980, we faced a dusty shelf of reports which pointed out our predecessors had been so busy spending money on new lands for parks that they'd seriously neglected basic upkeep of the magnificent parks we had. So we temporarily put off acquiring new parkland and started a new billion-dollar five-year program to repair and modernize facilities at our national parks and wildlife refuges. If you've been to just about any national park lately, you've probably seen the results. We've nearly finished repairing the damage from years of neglect, and I've asked the Congress for almost $160 million to resume buying lands to round out our national park and refuge systems. We also took the lead in developing a new approach to protecting some 700 miles of undeveloped coastal areas, the dunes, beaches, and barrier islands that are some of our most beautiful and productive natural resources. Now, there are some who want you to believe that commitment to protecting the environment can be measured by comparing the budgets of EPA under the previous administration with those proposed and approved by the Congress under my administration. But they deliberately ignore that the major federal environmental laws are designed to be carried out by the states in partnership with EPA. By the time the clean air, clean water, and other big programs put in place in the early 1970s moved into their second decade, the states had largely taken over the job formerly performed by the federal government. With this successful delegation to the states, EPA, under the leadership of Bill Ruckelshaus, has been freed to move on to the challenges of the 1980s, such as cleaning up abandoned toxic waste dumps, under our administration, funding for the Superfund cleanup program will have increased from just over $100 million in 1981 to $620 million in 1985. By the end of this year, EPA expects to have undertaken more than 400 emergency actions to remove and contain public health hazards. And because we recognize that we need to do more cleanup work than the current law provides, I'm committed to seeking an extension of the Superfund program. As I said, our progress on protecting the environment is one of the best-kept secrets in Washington. You have just heard excerpts from statements on environmental policy by President Reagan made in the 1980s. The audio was released under a Creative Commons license by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Reagan would later become central in the ratification of the treaty that helped solve the most pressing environmental problem of his day, 
the hole in the ozone layer. We came to Washington, committed to respect the great bounty and beauty of God's creation. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free radio stream, promoting knowledge of literature and history.